Yeah, as David um, explained, I, I'm, I'm a reformed master of the universe. <clears throat> I traded derivatives for Goldman Sachs and then ran a, a trading desk for Deutsche Bank. And <clears throat> in a moment of sheer insanity, I walked away from a high paying job on Wall Street to take up the minimum wage job of science and actually start studying traders rather than being one of them. Um, all I can say is that my wife is still haven't, hasn't forgiven me. <clears throat> the reason I made that move um, <clears throat> is I became increasingly uh, disillusioned with the explanations we had for the pathologies of risk taking that we observe on Wall Street and unfortunately everybody outside of Wall Street has to live with. Um, there's a tendency in all the subjects um, that you're taught at university that at, um, are supposed to explain instability in the financial markets, such as economics, um, finance, even psychology, <clears throat> to assume that, the, that what's going on when you take financial risk is a purely cognitive activity. And I'd say that, that beyond the financial world, I think the way we, we observe any of our jobs, any white collar job, as being a cognitive activity, I began to think that that was a profound error um, I, I thought so because I was experiencing, when I was taking financial risk, I was on a physical roller coaster ride. When you're on a winning streak or a losing streak or when volatility is extremely high as it was during the credit crisis, this is a profoundly physical experience. And that's not something I thought was, um, was being appreciated um, in <clears throat> the subject studying, um, studying the markets. So we've taken a, a very different approach. And that is we're looking at the pathologies on Wall Street uh, in the financial world as being no different from any other medical um, pathology. Our, our research group is now mostly um, hails from departments of medicine, mostly at Cambridge, but also from other universities. And we're combining field work with lab work. We're studying traders in the wild, so to speak. We take the observations we make back to Addenbrooke's hospital, and then we make more sense of it in more controlled laboratory conditions. I think. The most profound difference between what we're doing and what I was, what I was work, thinking before using standard economics and finance occurred when I went back to Cambridge and ran across a group of ideas which I found extremely powerful. And that is that we've got the wrong model of what is involved when we take risk, and specifically financial market risk, in thinking that it is a cognitive process. Because we all seem to be profoundly influenced by this ancient philosophical idea of a mind-body split that we can in some way separate the products of the mind from the products of the body, and I think it's a profound error. A much more valuable way to look at us is to do what a number of neuroscientists and engineers at Cambridge and around the world are doing, and that is putting movement at the very core of our design. They're now saying, asking, they ask a very basic question, why do we have a brain and other creatures don't? And they come back with the answer that we have a brain and plants don't, because if you don't need to move, you don't need a brain. The point of the brain is to plan and execute movement. It's not to support the type of pure thought that Plato and Descartes and economics tends to assume. And if you put movement at the very core of your design and think it through, I'm willing to bet that everything about you, the way you understand yourself, the way you understand your jobs, your employees, the way you understand the financial markets, will change profoundly. Because it turns out that what we think is happening, that with a brain that's designed plan and execute movement. When you take in information, when you think through a thought, what your brain is doing silently behind the scenes is figuring out what movement might ensue from this information, and then it's preparing your body. You can often see this process in a person's face when you talk to them. People with very um, labile faces are, are delightfully called facial athletes. And when you speak to them and they're taking in information, you can see their eyes widen and squint. Their complexion change from a pallor to a blanch. And this changing weather on their face indicates that when they're taking in this information, it's not just a cognitive process, it's very physical. And what you're seeing in their face, you're seeing throughout their bodies. It's entirely possible that for humans, there's no such thing as pure thought. Every thought you think comes coupled with some physical change. And this completely changes the way we understand things like workplace stress. And that's sort of where I'm heading in this talk. Now, one part of the brain is a be beautiful illustration of how this happens. Um, and that's the locus ceruleus. There's fantastic work being done right now on the influence of, on information theory and physiological arousal. Now, understand what I mean by information. I mean true Shannon information. Shannon, when he developed information theory at Bell Labs in the 1950s, said the following, 
that when you're in receipt of information, you're in a state of maximal uncertainty. Now that sounds counterintuitive. We don't know what the results of an election are going to be. We're uncertain. The results come out. The uncertainty goes away. But that's not what he's talking about. What he meant was that when you're in receipt of a signal of pure information, you never know what's coming next. Because if you did, it wouldn't be information. So when you're listening to a stream of pure information, you're in a constant state of uncertainty. And it turns out that our sensory apparatus, our whole physiology, has been exquisitely designed to attend only to information. We ignore the chafing of our clothes on our skin as we walk along the street. We ignore the background noise of traffic because there's no information in it. But when something novel happens, you go into your apartment, the furniture's out of place, you watch the plane slamming into the World Trade Center, all of a sudden you're in, the, you're in possession of, of, of information. You've received something novel. You're in a state of uncertainty and your entire physiology responds. The locus ceruleus, which is sort of the vigilance center of the brain, when it's in in the presence of information, it sprays noradrenaline into the upper reaches of your body, or your brain, and that allows you to hear the faintest noise and see the slightest movement. This is a wonderful radar-enhancing property of noradrenaline. But just as equally, it increases the signal-to-noise ratio, so you can focus on just that information that's relevant to the problem at hand. But it's not confined to the brain, because at the same time it's doing that, it's projecting its noradrenaline down into the body and triggering the fight-or-flight mechanism. So this is a beautiful example of how something as pure as information is causing a physical change. Now, we've been following this in traders because it turns out the financial markets are a beautiful venue in which to study um, not just financial risk-taking pathologies, but to work on um, a model of workplace stress that's, that's applicable outside of finance. And the reason we can do that is because the data in finance is so clean if you wanted to study the amount of stress on a lawyer or a doctor, you'd have a very hard time coming up with an index for that load. But in finance, you've got the profit and loss, which you get from the back office. You've got the amount of risk they're taking, which is the VAR, value at risk, that comes from the back office. You've got the volatility of the market. You've got the expected volatility of the market. These are all very clean numbers. And it means that we can go in and look at how information is impacting their physiology, and in fact, how information can make them sick. Um, now, the prime mechanism through which information affects your state of arousal is the stress response. I, I think it's extremely important to understand that, w that your common sense understanding of stress is incorrect. We all tend to think it's a psychological phenomenon, a state of being upset because something nasty has happened to you. That's not what stress is. Stress is merely a physical preparation for impending physical activity. So when you go into a mild stressor, and understand even getting up from your chair and going to the coffee room is a mild stressor, your stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, suppress your digestive system because it's not needed when you're in the middle of a crisis. So they, it suppresses your reproductive tract because you don't need to be having sex when you're fighting off a grizzly bear. After a while, under conditions of chronic stress, it starts affecting your immune system. It either suppresses it, or some people believe it's not a suppression of the immune system, but a shift from Th1 to Th1 um, cytokines. And instead, it, after shutting down long-term functions of your body, it mobilizes energy for immediate use. So it breaks down energy stores, glucose from your muscle and liver, free fatty acids from your fat cells, so that you have fuel to power you through whatever challenge you're facing right now. Now, there's three situations under which you experience the most pronounced stress response. And those are situations of novelty, uncertainty, and unpredictability. If you put an animal in a new cage, even though there's nothing overtly threatening about that new cage, it's novel, it doesn't know what to expect, it marshals a preparatory stress response, just to be ready. Uncertainty. Back in the 70s, they did these experiments where they exposed both an animal or, or a human to a repetitive, slightly aversive stimuli, like a blast of white noise. And if those blasts were delivered at regular intervals, so they're predictable, at the end of the experiment, stress hormones might be perfectly unchanged. But when they started altering the timing of those blasts, that, that noise, so it became harder and harder to predict, the cortisol levels started rising. And when the blasts became, the noises were perfectly random, meaning they couldn't be predicted at all, the cortisol levels hit the maximum. So it's uncertainty <coughs> over the timing of something nasty happening to you that causes the most pronounced stress response. The stress response is preparatory. 
That's why uncertainty has such a large effect on it. Well, novelty, uncertainty, uncontrollability, as you can imagine, that defines a trader's life in the markets. So we went in to, to, to gauge this effect. And what we did for uncontrollability is that we looked at the variance of the trader's profitability. So if a trader is making 250,000 pounds day in, day out, he or she has complete control over his trading results. But if he then goes through a period where he's up 500, down a million, up 2 million, down 3 million, he or she has lost control. So what we've done as a proxy for uncontrollability is look at the variance of their trading results. And what you get here is this lovely plot. That's on the x-axis, you've got the standard deviation of their P&L, that's their profit or loss, and on the y-axis, their cortisol levels. So the higher, the, the more uncontrollability in their trading results, the higher their cortisol levels. Now that defines, that's a good measure of the, of the risk they've just been through, or the uncertainty they've been through. What about their uncertainty about tomorrow and the next day? Well, fortunately, again, in finance, we can measure uncertainty about the future because to price a derivative, like an options contract, you have to input in the model your estimate of future variance. This is called the implied volatility in the derivatives market. So what we did is look at the implied volatility of the markets they were trading and plot that against the, their stress hormone levels. And what we got the bottom line is the implied volatility of the German bond market, and the top line are the cortisol levels averaged across the trading floor. And as you can see, it's an unbelievably high R squared of 0.86. Now, a number of things. This is just an unbelievably beautiful result. I could talk about it all day. Just a couple of things. One, this replicates. We, we repeated this study last year during the Greek bailout crisis. We got almost the identical R squared. Um, this shows that the arousal of these traders was following the market volatility, tick for tick. It didn't matter whether they were trading, it didn't matter whether they were making or losing money, it was just being in the presence of that information. The other thing to note is that over the two weeks of this study, their cortisol levels drifted up 68%. Now that's a moderately high level. It's not extremely high, but it's moderately high. And in eight days, it's pushing on chronic. So my colleagues in the Department of Medicine, my endoc or endocrinologists said, you know, this could be starting to have effects on these people. <coughs> So to find out whether this is an important result or it's just sort of a curiosity, my hotshot endocrinologist colleagues took that endocrine profile and replicated it exactly in a group of volunteers at Addenbrooke's Hospital. We took their cortisol levels up using hydrocortisone, individualized for each person, 68% over an eight-day period. Then we gave them a standard um, state-of-the-art risk-taking task from which we could extract what are called the utility curves that underlie your risk preferences. Now, this is what a standard utility curve looks like. What the utility curve means is that if you eat a donut, the first donut you eat gives you a lot of pleasure. Second donut gives you pleasure, but not as much. The third donut, not as much. So what you find is a declining marginal utility from each donut you eat. And it turns out the same thing is true from the bets, the payoff of a bets, that if you a student, for example, values the first 100 pounds in a bet's payoff than they do the 100 pounds that would take their earnings from 900 pounds to 1,000. We have a diminishing marginal return from the, the payoff from a bet's. And that means we're all basically risk averse. Because the more money we make, the, more, the less we value it, so we don't take big risks as willingly as we take little risks. So, this is the utility curve underlying the risk preferences of the students in this study. And if we were to take replicate this with all the people in the room, we would get this curve as well. That shows a, a declining marginal utility of a bet's payoff and hence risk aversion. Now, it's important to note that in almost every single economic model that's used to understand the markets, there isn't a foundational assumption that this curve does not move. Risk preferences are a trait. It's something you're born with, they remain unchanged mostly throughout your life. And it's on the basis of that that most economic models are built. But after eight days of exposure to hydrocortisone, 68% increase, we found that the risk preferences collapsed. And this is a huge effect. The risk premiums that they're demanding from taking a bet increased 44%. This was an extremely large effect. Another thing to, and this wasn't even a large increase in cortisol. Can you imagine what happened during the credit crisis when implied volatility on the VIX, which is called the fear index, spiked from 12% to over 80% and stayed there for a year and a half? It's not surprising that 
the stress response that was triggered by that led to you know, what, what amounted to also a medical crisis, not just a financial one. During the years 2008 and 9, there was a dramatic spike in the incidence of both depression and cardiovascular disease in London, which they suspect was coming from this mechanism operating through the financial world. One other point to make. These traders were completely unaware that this was taking place. They were unaware that their stress hormones were rising. They were unaware that their risk preferences were changing. And I think that means is quite often when we think about the financial markets, we, we, we sort of frame the discussion with the concepts of rationality versus emotions. That debate is a red herring. Risk, shifting risk preferences are not rational or irrational. They're your preferences. And if, there's, if the traders are not aware of it, there's no emotion. It's silently shifting risk preferences that are causing the pathologies in risk taking in the financial world, both excessive risk taking on the way up and total risk aversion on the way down. The other thing is that because in the financial world we can quantify these effects so beautifully, we can start understanding, you know, what is the crossover between healthy acute stress and chronic stress? What is causing it? What can we do about it? And right now what we're doing is there's just enormous corporate interest in this research because it's the first time they've seen proper medical protocols applied in the workplace. And so at the, at the moment, I, we're, we're setting up a company that will be applying this research both to the, the, the role of um, performer optimization for, to risk management and most importantly to the stress programs and health assessments. So on that note, I'll, t I'll stop. Thank you very much. Great research, John, but what does it mean for us in practice investing our pension funds? Should we be injecting hormones into ourselves before buying our ICEs? No, but there's, um, you know, as you know, particularly as, as you know, uh, wearable tech is becoming extremely popular everywhere, including in the financial world. Um, and I think it pays, A, to learn the biology. First of all, just learning the biology does more than anything. But secondly, monitoring yourself. Um, I think is, will increasingly become important to human performance everywhere. You know, at the dawn of our civilization on the or or Temple of Delphi, it said, know yourself. And I think today that increasingly means know your biochemistry. Thank you, John Coates. Thank you.